So I thought I'd start um, just by talking a little bit about uh, just very generally adoption in Northern Ireland. Okay, so here's where we are. Belfast is in Northern Ireland, part of the UK, devolved, devolved government in the UK. Um, and our children's legislation is still our uh, Children Northern Ireland Order 1995, which is very similar to the Children Act. Um, and our adoption legislation is quite old. It's 1987, um, and, and it hasn't been updated because of difficulties with our devolved government. Um, but I think you'll see as I go through that practitioners in the region haven't let that hold them back, and that actually practice has developed and changed over the years, really in, in response to a number of things, in response to uh, the expectations of the courts, um, in response to uh, the families and the needs of children that they're being presented with. With. Um, so in Northern Ireland we currently have about 3,000 children who are in care, who are looked after children. Uh, that is I think about 35 per 10,000 of our children population, which is slightly less, slightly less um, percentage of the population than you would have here. Although similar to England and Wales we have seen, um, while that figure sounds low for Northern Ireland, practitioners in the region are similarly concerned that actually over the last couple of years that number has been really increasing steadily and, and stretching our court systems and stretching our, our resources for looked after children. We have about 3% of our looked after children are adopted each year. So last year there were 84 children adopted from care in Northern Ireland. Um, that's slightly lower than the year before, but it hovers around 90 each year um, on average children adopted from care in Northern Ireland. Um, similar to yourselves, we have a strong emphasis in our legislation around keeping children within their families of birth. So uh, most children will have lived at home for some period before they come into care. So the average age at the last care admission for all the children adopted last year was one year, six months. So it was the average length of time that children spent living at home with their birth families before they were adopted, which is probably very similar to yourselves. Obviously, we also have a strong emphasis on rehabilitation once children are in foster care um, and, and every effort needing to be made to get children home before we would have them adopted, um, which um, necessarily, I think, makes our adoption process lengthy. And like yourselves, there's this constant tension between making sure that assessments are robust, making sure that court hearings are fair, that due process is followed, and yet wanting not to delay things and to, to sort of shrink that time frame for adoption. But average time to adoption from last care admission hovers at around three years. And so children, the average age at adoption, four years, two months. I guess that's pretty similar uh, for yourselves. Um, perhaps, Maybe what's slightly different in Northern Ireland is that most of those children last year were adopted by their foster carers. 26 of those children were adopted by concurrent carers. Um, 25, I think, uh, 29 actually, by dual approved carers, and 23 by their former foster carers. We had a big push in the region recently to embed concurrent care as a way of working um, across all of our children's services through a project called Home on Time. Um, so uh, 26 of those children were placed in concurrent placements as very young infants they're, they're, uh, with their foster carers who went on to become their adoptive parents. Um, like yourselves, there's a strong emphasis on keeping children's contact with their family when they're in foster care. So most of these children who end up being adopted will have had contact with their birth relatives while they were still fostered. Um, and then, like for yourselves, the question becomes, once you then legally sever their relationship with their birth family, to what extent should you keep alive a relationship that you've ended legally? Okay, so that's a question for us as for yourselves. Um, and 46% of those children were adopted as a sibling group um, last year, and we've had a big push on um, having rolling training um, for prospective adopters around the issue of adopting sibling groups. But also I think because we do have contact uh, with birth family, um, adoptive parents are very aware of when another child is born into that family, of when another sibling comes along um, and, and maybe has more of an impetus to then go and adopt that child as well. Uh, just to kind of make the comparison that the grey bit of Ireland is Ireland, not Northern Ireland, where adoption is very different and they have very little adoption from care. 
um, some domestic infant adoption, but mostly um, international and intercountry adoption. So it's just interesting how our closest neighbours do things very differently. Um, I suppose it's a bit unusual, I think, to come and talk to you about something that isn't standard practice for you. Um, we do a lot of post-adoption contact. It is our norm, I would say, for adoption in Northern Ireland. Um, I would say that's not the case for yourselves in Wales, is my sense of it. Um, so why are we talking about something that you don't do as a matter of course? And I think the issue of open adoption has really gained traction, particularly in the last two years. You'll be familiar with British Association of Social Workers Adoption Inquiry, I'm sure most of you, written by Featherstone and Breach Featherstone and colleagues. And one of the recommendations out of that was um, to consider a more open model of adoption um, and whether um, our current system for adoption contact um, could be re reviewed or revised in some way. You'll also be familiar with the work of Beth Neal, I'm sure, in her contact after adoption study. So Beth recently wrote an article in Family Law, um, I suppose highlighting the fact that most of the adoption in England certainly is letter, or most of the contact after adoption is letterbox contact and quite often those arrangements are unsatisfactory. Quite often they're only one way. You know, adopters are sending letters out and getting no response and really can that be considered meaningfully any kind of contact for the child? It can't really. And so Beth wrote this, that the almost universal use of letterbox contact as a means for adopted children to stay in touch with their birth parents does need to be questioned. And there's scope for considering face-to-face -face contact in a greater number of cases. Now that's a view that Beth is, is proposing in family law that's echoed by the judiciary themselves. So Lord Justice McFarland in family law um, and in um, 2017 did a lecture, a uh, Bridget Lindley lecture on this. Um, he said the world has moved on yet we, that is the courts and social work practice, still hold to life story work and letterbox contact as setting the right level of post-adoption contact in most cases. A higher level of contact or a level of direct contact that develops slowly during childhood may well be better for these young people in the longer term. And I suppose Lord Justice McFarlane in his lecture and in his article in Family Law was encouraging social workers to consider when they're bringing adoption cases to the court to consider is there a way that maybe these children might have direct contact and, and just to keep that on our social work agenda. Um, so I suppose in some ways this, there, there is a, there's a bit of a sway towards, I mean these very influential voices are saying I think we need to be considering this. So I think it's something that we need to think about and I think that today Alison has invited me because um, we, are, we have grappled with this over a number of years in Northern Ireland and so maybe there's something that, that can be learnt um, about how to support these arrangements um, from our experience. Just to give you a bit of an international perspective on this, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the situation in New South Wales and Australia. So New South Wales, Sydney is in New South Wales. Um, and New South Wales has recently, um, so there, there historically has been quite a reluctance to pursue adoption in Australia for many reasons, much the same as in Ireland actually. Um, but they've recently had a push and changed their legislation to encourage more adoptions of children in care. In New South Wales, 131 of the whole 143 adoptions from care in the whole of Australia, which is a very large place, were in New South Wales and those children were typically adopted by their foster carers. What they have in their legislation though um, is that adoption plans must include details of contact arrangements and those contact arrangements then become a legally enforceable contract. Um, so. And, and usually contact orders specify the average kind of uh, arrangement is for face-to-face -face contact visits a year. But interestingly, they don't have any support for that. So basically, adoptive families are left to kind of get on with that themselves. So you can look up the um, Institute for Open Adoption Studies um, at the University of Sydney if you're interested in their experiences in New South Wales. They have a lot of resources um, on their website too. Just to give you a sense of what this is like across the UK. Um, so in your own Wales adoption cohort study, um, the questionnaire that they sent to 96 adoptive parents, and this was very soon after the adoption was made, I think within four months of the adoption. Um, so 
when they were asked about what the plans were for contact, so for a lot of these, it was so soon into the adoption that a lot of the contact hadn't happened yet, but what was the plan for contact? So all but one of those 96 adoptive parents said they had a plan for letterbox contact. Um, none of them had a plan for face-to-face -face birth parent contact. Um, and of those children who did have siblings living elsewhere, 24% of those siblings had a plan for direct contact. Uh, Beth Neal has recently done an adoption survey in uh, the English counties of Yorkshire and Humberside. Um, so she was asking, she sent a questionnaire to 319 adoptive parents at all sorts of stages after the adoption, right? Um, and she was asking not about the plans, but the actual contact that they had. And she found that 66% of those families had letterbox contact. 3% um, of those families had face-to-face -face contact with the birth parent. And 25% of the children who had siblings living elsewhere had contact with them. Now Beth's view, because she's obviously done the contact after adoption study previously, and her view is that actually in England the rate of direct contact has shrunk, um, isn't increasing, and has actually got less since she did her initial study. So the study we're going to talk about today is uh, one that I did with Adoption UK in Northern Ireland, um, and that was a questionnaire to 93 adoptive parents and this was a questionnaire only to people who did have contact, okay? Um, and 52% of them had letterbox contact, 65% had direct contact with birth parents, and 53% had face-to-face -face contact with siblings. So it's interesting how across the UK we have very different ways of doing post-adoption contact. They are very similar children. Okay, these are all children who are adopted because they have experienced or were at risk of experiencing significant harm at home with their birth parents, whose extended birth family didn't have the resources or the ability to care for them. Okay, they're all, they're very similar children, but yet we have this very different approach to this question of to what extent should they keep the relationship after it's legally severed. Uh, I suppose it's fair to say, um, though, that adoption practitioners have become very accustomed to this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the support mechanisms that we have in terms of post-adoption support specifically for contact. But it doesn't mean that practitioners in Northern Ireland are entirely comfortable with the situation. The, uh, the situation has come and the practitioners wouldn't have been the people to have driven this, I think it's fair to say, okay? That this situation has been um, a very organic kind of situation that has arisen in the court arena, in this um, negotiation that goes on in the process of freeing order uh, proceedings and adoption order proceedings. Um, and just to give you a bit of an insight into the thinking of the judiciary in Northern Ireland, who practitioners would feel have been the driving force for post-adoption contact. Um, so this is one judgment from 2004 where uh, the, the judge said, it appears to us where such contact is likely to benefit the child it should only exceptionally be denied. Now this judge was talking specifically about grandparent contact, but over the years the same sentiment has been applied to um, uh, birth parent contact and, and most of the contact is with birth parents and again the um, the adoption inquiry run by Breach Featherstone and for Baswa said this that the inquiry heard that the picture in relation to direct contact is different in Northern Ireland where judges may recommend such contact takes place sometimes between four to six times a year um, and again emphasizing that it's judges that are driving a lot of this so what um, is it that judges are kind of like falling back to in their thinking, what influences their thinking on that. Um, we don't have any specific requirement in our law. The Adoption and Children Act 2002 has a specific requirement that you consider contact, okay? We don't have that in our legislation, it doesn't say that. Um, so contact falls under the best interests of the child and it is one of the things that must be considered when judges are considering is this adoption in this child's best interests okay so when we look at all the case law that has been written about this uh, judges are very clearly saying that it must be beneficial to the child right social workers sometimes question whether the contact is beneficial to the child we come on and look at that um, they are also saying that it must not undermine the adoptive family. 
that it mustn't take away control from adoptive parents, that it mustn't be so frequent that it overburdens the adoptive family life, uh, that children must be allowed to prepare for contact and recover from contact, okay? that it should only be the case in, in situations where um, birth parents can broadly support uh, the adoption. Okay, So that's what judges are saying about post-adoption contact. And in relation to adoptive parents' um, control and sense of control and their absolute authority in terms of being the only people who carry parental responsibility, uh, the court could make contact orders attached to an adoption order, but they don't. And they have really shied away from doing that. Um, so whenever I talk about all this contact that's going on, that the adoptive parents told us about, just bear in mind that very, very few of these arrangements will there be like a mandated court order for this. Now, when I come on and talk through adoptive parents' views, you'll hear that this is not how adoptive parents perceive. So all this, what judges are saying is their thinking, isn't quite how adoptive parents perceive the situation. So. And again, as I said, um, there's some disquiet among uh, adoption practitioners as well. Um, it does generate professional disquiet. And I think that's around this difficulty of upholding the child's right to ongoing connection and their right to have contact with how do you do that in a way that isn't harmful, that isn't distressing, or rather the question is how much distress is too much distress? You know, how much emotional upset is too much emotional upset? And how do we best support these arrangements in the context where we're all very busy and pressurised? Um, so I think one of the messages is that these arrangements do need to be quite well supported and supported in quite a sophisticated way. And I'm going to give you an indicator of how um, the types of support that we have and how adoptive parents have sort of evaluated those. This is a study I'm going to talk about, and you have a little three-page summary of this. I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail, but what we did, uh, not last year, the year before, was um, a survey with Adoption UK members in Northern Ireland, um, specifically on this question of post-adoption contact. Uh, Part of our post-adoption support in Northern Ireland is that for a number of years, um, new adoptive parents have had their membership of that organisation paid for them by the Department for Health. Okay? So what that means is that most adoptive parents in Northern Ireland are on this membership list. So it gives us a fairly full kind of um, set of people to go to. Um, so all, so about 533 member families, all were invited to participate, but we asked them only to participate if they do have post-adoption contact with birth family. Okay, so this is the survey <coughs> only to those people who said, yes, that's me, I have contact. So 26 adoptive parents took part in focus groups, 93 answered an online survey. We wanted to know what was the nature and extent of post-adoption contact in Northern Ireland, what are the challenges and benefits, what support for contact do adoptive parents use and how helpful is it. So I suppose about a fifth of the membership of Adoption UK in Northern Ireland took, play, took part in the survey. Um, so what we can say, we don't know how many people are having contact, you don't know how many people are having contact here, uh, but at least a fifth of that membership are. Okay, and it's likely to be higher than that because not everybody who's having contact wanted to answer my very long, detailed, boring survey, and it was long and detailed. So, what sort of contact were those uh, 93 families having? All the focus group people had direct contact. Um, so you'll see in this that the blue and orange wedges taken together are all the children. We asked people to answer the survey on the basis of their most recently adopted child. So one child per family. This is answered on. Um, so that's 73 of the 93 children were having face-to-face -face contact with a birth relative. Um, 35 of those were also having contact by phone or letter or email. Okay, so direct and indirect. And only 12 of them only had indirect contact. Who was that with? We well, see there that 65 of them, so the blue columns are letter-based contact and the green columns are direct contact. So 60 children were having direct contact with a birth parent, 22 with some other adult birth relative and 54 with a sibling. But when we look at that more closely, 
you can see there again the blue column is letterbox contact and the green column is face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you'll see there that face-to-face -face contact was much more likely to be with birth mothers than birth fathers. Um, and contact with other relatives was likely to be with maternal relatives rather than paternal relatives. And I think that's, I mean, the role of father is right the way through from the very beginning when children are sort of, when our family support starts, um, I think is problematic. And that's reflected uh, right through to this stage. Um, you'll also see there that while children had a lot of contact with brothers and sisters, most of that contact was with brothers and sisters um, who were adopted or fostered elsewhere. So 30 of them had face-to-face -face meetings with birth siblings who were adopted or fostered elsewhere. Um, and very few of them, or, or not very few of them, I mean there was 8 and 11, but fewer of them um, had meetings with birth, with siblings who continue to live with a birth parent or who were in a kinship placement with one of their birth relatives. So I think that raises questions for us as well. So we, we look like we have a lot of sibling contact, but it's with a particular type of sibling and siblings in particular relationships. And so ch some children, you know, aren't having the... Um, and what we have actually, so we have an organisation, Voice of Young People in Care, and they have an advocacy service. And uh, one of the reasonably common advocacy pieces of work that they pick up are siblings, older siblings who have lived at home or are living with grandparents, but whose younger sibling has been adopted. Um, and they're saying, but I want to see my younger sibling. They have got to the stage where they're able to do that independently. Um, and they can go to court and take contact orders and are, you know, have the, use this advocacy service to try and make that inroad themselves when they become a bit older. So I think that's a group that we need to be thinking about children, you know, how we maintain relationship with children who remain in kinship placements or at home. Does that surprise you, those figures? Um, you're probably not surprised about the, the difference between mothers and fathers. I think that probably reflects um, your ability to engage fathers all, all the way through the process. You didn't look at significant others. So, uh, we did ask, I can't remember now, did we ask? So we, we tried to, I think, I think this was a tick box, I think we maybe did have another section, but these were the main categories, yeah. Um, and so aunts, uncles, cousins, you can see there were very few there. And I suppose one of the things I've always argued um, is that in our courts, we tend to focus on birth parent contact and more recently on sibling contact. And there are some difficulties with particularly birth parent contact, but quite often there are grandparents who maybe have acted in a very protective way towards children over the years, um, and they aren't routinely considered in our court arena. Um, and I think that there's probably, and certainly Beth Neal's work would say this as well, that there's probably scope to consider a wider range of relatives who could offer a positive relationship to the child in a less conflicted way um, that I think we're not capturing with our, our contact arrangements. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do your um, figures include one-off contacts that sometimes take place at the point of uh, placement, or is this only ongoing face-to-face? -face so this was the, so the question was, do you have have you had contact after the adoption? So this was not situations where, because sometimes adoptive parents would meet with birth parents and that would be a meeting for them. So this was contact for the child yeah. that took place after the adoption. So it wouldn't have just been those one-off kind of yeah. meeting to kind of seal the adoption type meetings. It was contact for the child. Yeah. What was the age range of the children? Oh yeah, so most of them were aged under five. I think about 70% were aged under five and had been adopted in the last five years. But they were aged, they ranged right up to 18. Um, so there was a broad spread of time frames for adoption as well, um, but most of them were in the last five years. And to give you some sort of indication, we sort of worked out that um, I think was it 70, 70 odd of them were um, adopted in the preceding five years. But anyway, whatever figure were adopted in the last five years represented about a fifth of all the children who'd been adopted from care in that five year period. So we don't know, again, you can sort of say, well, at least a fifth of those children were having contact. In our survey, we asked people to uh, 
um, lots of tick box and lots of open-ended questions and whatever. Um, and we used, um, Beth Neal has adopted parents' experiences of contact measure and there's a series of statements that people fill in. So um, as I go through, you'll see some statements and those were taken from that measure and a few others that we added in. So I'm just going to go through some of the key themes um, that came out of what people were saying. Uh, broadly, people felt uh, that, um, sorry, I just lost my place here. I suppose there was a range of experiences about contact, but broadly, adoptive parents, their broad view was, I think it is better to have contact, but that doesn't mean that it's easy or that everybody's <coughs> comfortable with it. Um, so you'll see, um, Roughly two thirds thought that their child was better off having the contact. Just almost a half said, "Look, I wouldn't. I've had a magic wand. I wouldn't stop it." Um, you know, most sort of about again two thirds disagreed that they regretted having the contact. Um, and some of the things they appreciated out of the contact, and you'll see at the bottom there, that they felt proud and pleased to tell their birth relatives about their child's achievements, um, that it was an opportunity to talk about their child to their birth relative and to affirm that the child was doing well, but also that it opened up adoption talk within uh, the family home. So some of the benefits of contact uh, that they identified um, was that it really helped children to understand their own story and the reasons for adoption. Um, it helped them not to have these romanticised views of their birth parents. Um, and some people talked about how it really absolved their children from a sense of guilt for being responsible for being removed from their parents when they saw their parents' own difficulties and that actually they were responsible for their own lives um, and that that was helpful. Um, so there are no secrets, there's no intrigue, they don't fill the voids with fantasy information and it debunks the whole myth that this mum is a perfect person, she gets to see birth mum warts and all. However, that was only the case whenever they did get to see birth parents warts and all and some adoptive parents were frustrated that actually the contact and the way it was set up um, wasn't truthful in some ways um, and didn't allow this process to take place because everybody was so concerned about making this a lovely day out for the child. You don't want it to be a horrible day out for the child. But the consequence of making it a lovely day out for the child was this, that it creates an illusion that the birth father would be kind, caring and capable of looking after them, which he wasn't. Contact visits are made up of fun, treats and presents. What child doesn't want these? But it creates illusions of birth family life. And so the most helpful contacts, it's not that people were saying, I want my child to have a horrible time, but the most helpful contacts were, were where children were able to see, get a realistic picture um, of their birth parents' warts and all and that kept fantasies at bay. So there's a bit of a tension there between making it pleasant for everyone but not so pleasant that it's, it's unrealistic. Some of the challenges of contact then, and there were real practical challenges with this contact. Um, and I suppose the statement that um, had the highest level of agreement of any of those statements was this, that it's difficult when birth relatives do not turn up for contact or change plans at the last minute. Um, you know, sometimes birth parents were erratic, they had difficulties keeping to a contact routine. Um, they, uh, and, and some people had had to find very creative ways of managing that. Um, and actually what they found was that social workers didn't really help with that. So adoptive parents talked a lot about, for example, having to take days off work to facilitate the contact visit. Okay, that's okay, but it's not okay if you've taken the day off work and then somebody doesn't come because then you've taken another day off work and they're saying that's eating into our family time to have to do that. But yet social workers weren't available on the weekends <coughs> um, to do weekend contact. Um, and I suppose they felt that they could understand that birth parents' lives were difficult and chaotic and could sort of empathise with that and, and give that a bit of a bye-ball in some ways, but they felt that social workers needed to be a bit stronger about recognising the burden on family life. And so they said, yeah, so two-thirds said that having contact puts more pressure on my family than not having contact, 
But you'll see there that two thirds of people said, well, actually, I'm happy with how often contact takes place. And most of this contact took place twice a year. I'm going to go on and say that there are lots of people who didn't, who had more frequent contact. But one of the recommendations that we made on the back of this was that actually the court tussles and social workers tussle what's the right frequency of contact. And I suppose what we have said and recommended from this is that if this was working, because it only happened twice a year, any more than twice a year, and actually it might have been so onerous that it would have kind of pushed people over the edge a little bit in terms of their just their general day-to-day -day busyness and hassles of daily life, and this added in on top of it. Um, so as I say, most families have contact visits twice a year, but almost a third, 26 families, had more frequent meetings, some of them up to 12 times a year. Actually, we had, there were, uh, three or four children who were having monthly contacts and I think it's really fascinating it'd be a really fascinating study to find out how was that working you know those are with birth parents you know how were people sustaining that how had those arrangements come about you know just really interesting um, but that wasn't the only so the frequency wasn't of any particular contact wasn't the thing that made it most complicated um, I suppose 18 of the children had separate plans for contact with various birth relatives. Um, so for example, they might have sibling contact separate from birth parent contact, or birth parents, birth mother and birth father had separated, had new families, blended families, and they had to have separate contacts because of their own, those two were acrimonious and they wanted separate contact. Um, the other issue was siblings created by adoption, so where people had um, adopted children from different families, that was two, two sets of, or sometimes three sets of birth relatives that had to be accommodated. Um, and so in 28% of the families, there were two or more adopted children who were having contact with their separate kind of um, birth families. Um, and so that all made for a very busy and complicated schedule of contact. And particularly where there were quite a number of siblings, one of the challenges was, well, how do you find, A, how do you get a date that suits everybody? B, how do you get an activity that is suitable for this age and this age? Okay, you know, how do we find something that meets everybody's needs? Um, and so I thought this, this summed it up, you know, where this person said, you know, well, my two children here are siblings, and then their other two older siblings, and then birth mum and dad, as well as the post-adoption worker, myself, another adoptive father, a foster mum, all have to arrange a suitable date and venue. This is very hard, <laughs> right? Understatement or what? Okay, so there you have five separate households, plus a social work office, and ten individuals, all with very different needs, needing to be accommodated. But what's the alternative? The alternative would have been five separate meetings at five separate times. So it's just thinking about the logistics of this and what it means in family life when you're already running to swimming lessons, football matches, etc. Now people were still saying, yes, we want to do it, but we'd like, this was a message from adoptive parents, was we'd like some acknowledgement that actually this can be a bit complicated and it is a bit onerous at times. Not that we want to stop doing it, but that it is a bit um, onerous. One of the biggest challenges of contact actually was managing the relationships during contact. So you'll see there that uh, sort of over half of the people said that they didn't really find um, birth relatives all that easy to relate to. Um, again, over half, um, well, I suppose it's encouraging actually that more than half said that the birth relatives have accepted the adoption. Two thirds said that the birth relatives were able to uh, respect their role as mum and dad. And I think probably because these are all people who have contact, these are situations that have been screened out to a large extent, that that's probably a prerequisite really for being able to maintain this contact over time. In terms of managing the relationships though, um, most of the contact took place in public parks, soft play areas, Okay, very activity based or sometimes in contact centres, but, um, but a quarter of it took place actually in contact centres. So those meetings that were in activity based venues were described as natural, relaxed, children were comfortable, they enjoyed it, they liked playing, etc. But the downside of those venues was that um, children could run off and play and not interact with the adults, which left adoptive parents kind of sitting talking to birth parents and the child merrily in the corner of some soft play area somewhere, 
not interacting with anybody. You know, you know how those places work. And so people were frustrated and saying, what is the point? The child's having a great time, but actually they're not really interacting with their birth parents. So then when they moved to a venue with less distractions where uh, people had to talk to one another, adoptive parents find that quite tricky because you're tr it's just harder work trying to manage what do you talk about how do you uh, scaffold this interaction so just on a very straightforward level they were saying you know, it's quite difficult trying to make conversation with people I don't know and I had very little in common with you know yourself if you just sit for an hour in a coffee shop with somebody you don't know very well and have very little in common with never mind the emotions that go with that set of arrangements you know that needs some scaffolding I think and um, people were a bit frustrated as well with the quality of the contact and how little birth parents interacted with the children. So like this person said, you know, the birth mum was happy to sit and watch her child rather than initiate play. Even though we tried to get them to initiate play, they wouldn't interact, they just sort of sat and watched. Or sometimes they were frustrated that birth parents sat on their phone or just didn't know how to engage with the child and just were happy to sit and watch. Now, for me, there's something about expectations, actually, um, and maybe sitting and watching and just being in the room together serves its own purpose. And maybe we need to give more realistic expectations of what good quality engagement actually is in that kind of... Um, some children were disappointed by that. Some people said their children were just frustrated that their birth parent didn't talk to them. But other people said, well, actually, generally, the children are happy to check that the birth parents are OK and then go home again. And so for the children, it was a checking in exercise. And some people find that tokenistic. What is the point of a checking in exercise? And other people said, well, actually, it's quite good that that's all it is because nobody gets very worked up. <laughs> And everybody gets to see one another, check that everybody's still fine, and go their separate ways again. And so that had its own value as well. Um, in terms of sibling contact um, and siblings placed apart, siblings placed in separate placements, whether they were fostered or adopted or, or with birth family, um, as people really appreciated that content, contact by and large. They really appreciated the opportunity to give children a chance to build a relationship that might see them right through their lifetime. Okay, and, and, and there was very strong motivation for that contact. Um, and as this person said, it allows them to bond and maintain relationships that they can continue into adulthood. Um, it was somewhat easier to have that contact based around an activity because you know, older brothers and sisters were able to run off and play on the soft play area in a way that an adult doesn't really have the agility to go and do, okay? Not least anything else. Um, and so those kind of real activities that, that meant this is a fun family day out worked very well for people. Um, where siblings came along to birth parent contact, that was valued because even if the interaction with a birth parent wasn't all that great, it still gave the children chance to meet their siblings. You know, so actually bringing all the contact together was still useful. Um, and where birth parents over time disengaged from the contact, children were able to still keep an eye on what was happening with their birth family because they were able to keep in contact with their, with their siblings. So it served a whole lot of purposes. Some of the um, difficulties, though, that came up um, around that, and I mean, you're aware of this from your own, um, you know, sharing of information and misinformation and all sorts of information and, and rumour mongering about family or telling uh, younger children things that really they weren't ready to hear about birth parents. There's a lot of that going on. Um, Children also worried about the welfare of siblings who were uh, still living with in kinship families or uh, with their birth parents and because they were aware of a massive difference in their lives. Now that maybe says something about how we resource children who remain at home, how we resource kinship care, that the children were saying, I'm very worried about them, that there's, you know, that's, that's maybe a responsibility for us, but that was one of the issues for them. Um, and some people worried about the negative influence of siblings and said things like, oh my goodness, this brother is who my child looks up to. He absolutely idolises them. And so he's following the example of drinking, smoking, trending, etc. And if he didn't have the contact, this wouldn't be happening. So there's a bit of concern around the negative influence. Siblings adopted together. There were some issues around that. So where siblings were placed in the one placement, you couldn't assume that they had the same experience of contact. 
Because for some children, even though they were siblings, living in the same home together, some of them had very different experiences of contact and people were quite concerned about that. Um, and it created a great deal of upset when a birth parent treated one child more favourably than the other. Um, and so on the one hand, they were worried about the, that the rejection of the one child was more stark when they saw the acceptance of the other child played out in front of them. Um, so they worried about the impact of that rejection on the, the child, but also they worried about the impact on the relationship between the siblings in placement that was divisive in some way to that. Um, and thinking about the sorts of situations that this happened in, um, it tended to be... Uh, so older siblings who maybe had lived at home longer and that birth parents knew better and who, or who had parented for longer got more attention because they were more familiar with that child and they already had more of an attachment, more of a relationship with them. Sometimes it was gender based, boys were favoured over girls, girls over boys and sometimes it was about who the child's birth father was that mothers could relate to the child born of one father in a way that they couldn't relate to a child born of another father, which is about their relationship. So like this person said, our children have the same birth mother, but different birth fathers. They've both had two very different experiences of birth mother. Our son was more or less rejected from when he was born, but our daughter was put on a pedestal and very much given anything she wanted. Okay, and so the children find that difficult. Um, one of the other issues in contact was negotiating social media. Very few of these families had um, actual social media contact. Um, in only, I think, two of the situations did the children surreptitiously behind anybody's back go on social media. So there wasn't a lot of that. That wasn't a problem, but probably because the children were younger. What was a problem was birth parents taking photographs of children surreptitiously during contact and sharing them on social media and concern about the lack of privacy settings on, on these are getting shared and shared and shared and shared and I'm not going to read through these but they very much wanted social workers to be much more of a presence in terms of stopping that happening. Um, they considered that a violation of children's privacy. So that was the issue in terms of social media, not children using it, but how birth parents shared images really on their own social media accounts. Mm. I just want to say really quickly the emotional impact of contact on children because, uh, can you just take another couple of minutes and then we'll take questions, is that okay, Alison? Um, these are children who have experienced adversity. And I think that in our, um, uh, in our support for this, we need to think about what the impact of that adversity is on children um, and how that plays out at contact. Um, people, people's uh, descriptions of their children really ranged from very difficult emotional reactions to just a bit of upset. Um, but there's definitely a need to think about, you know, one of the issues was that the social workers supervising contact didn't actually um, understand trauma. Um, they didn't understand that actually being smothered with hugs and kisses was not necessarily a good thing or faux sociability wasn't a good thing. And so there's a real need um, to understand what the impact of adversity is in children and how that plays out in contact arrangements. And so there's a whole literature around like, giving children ability to self-regulate and educating birth parents about the, ch the child's needs and also about empowering practice that listens to children's experiences and empowering practice that listens. Um, birth par our adoptive parents felt very um, pressurised into some of this. So just, just to say that most of these families did have support for contact. Okay, our, our systems have developed so that our post-adoption support teams, so most of the people who had face-to-face -face meetings had a social worker who helped them set that up and most of them had a social worker present. What adopters wanted from that support was somebody who would help everybody prepare for the meeting. <coughs> that this meeting couldn't, couldn't just plonk down on people's lives because it couldn't sustain the weight of all of that, that there needed to be preparation for children, for adopters, for birth parents before the meeting. Social workers needed to be a strong presence during the meeting that couldn't always be down to adoptive parents to say, remember you signed an agreement that you weren't going to take photographs. Okay, it wasn't fair on adopters to have to do that. They wanted social workers to do that. 
and also after the contact just for somebody to phone up and say how was that how do you feel how's the child um, and to be empathetic and to really take note of what children's experiences were after the contact um, and so really this kind of idea of family focused support for contact which is about pre preparing everybody and listening to everybody's perspectives and helping all the parties tune into one another's needs and into the child's needs before they even meet being there facilitating interaction being a strong presence to kind of guard the boundaries and then afterwards just a quick phone call even to say how are you how's your child <laughs>